I think the uh, panel is, is timely, certainly with the discussion about the continuing resolution this week, uh, and obviously the discussion about the debt and the deficit. Uh, and, and clearly entitlement spending uh, being a key uh, to reducing the size of the debt, uh, reducing the size uh, of the deficit. Uh, so we are all looking for new ideas and new ways to approach this. Uh, our particular uh, view of this is that uh, we want to identify evidence-based programs that prevent disease, avert disease in the first place, and effective ways of coordinating care for patients that have multiple chronic health care conditions. So the discussion that uh, we think from an entitlement standpoint can't just be about cutting payment rates and cutting benefits and increasing copays and deductibles. After all, that's really just shifting costs across the system. We really need to figure out ways to really reduce costs in the system. And if the effective way to reduce costs in the system is to find evidence-based programs that prevent disease and ways of keeping people out of the hospital and keeping them from being readmitted. And I'll just give you one statistic before I turn it over to our panel. Um, Everybody has seen the statistics from MedPAC about potentially preventable readmissions in the Medicare program, uh, about 20 percent. Uh, what that means is that over the next decade, Medicare is going to spend nearly $250 billion uh, in Medicare spending on readmissions that are potentially preventable. It's a lot of money. As Congressman Price said, why not that discussion? Why not figure out how to uh, scale and replicate uh, effective interventions that do transitional care, that do team-based care, build it into Medicare, build it into Medicaid, integrate it more fully into the private sector. Well, that's what we're going to hear about today. Uh, we have three terrific uh, presentations that are going to give us examples of interventions that have shown to be effective uh, in the private sector. Uh, let me introduce them, uh, I'll introduce them, them all, and then uh, uh, they can appear in the, in the order that I introduce them. First is uh, Dr. Earl Steinberg, uh, a longtime colleague, I'm not going to say old, longtime colleague uh, of WellPoint, uh, nation's, the nation's largest health benefits company, where he oversees the company's clinical strategy, quality, and outcomes division. Next, we'll hear from uh, Jonathan Le Lever, Vice President for Health Strategy and Innovation uh, for the YMCA of the USA. Uh, Jonathan has been a chief architect and leader of the WISE response uh, to the nation's lifestyle health crisis. Uh, we've been personally working with him on issues around taking the diabetes prevention program and building it out into community-based settings, uh, which, as you're going to hear in a minute, uh, saves money. Uh, last but not least, we'll hear from Chris Porter at Novo Nordisk. Chris is Director of Government Affairs, uh, and as an employee, not only knows about uh, his company's employees' wellness efforts, but also benefits from them himself. He leads the company's federal legislative PAC and grassroots advocacy efforts. Um, we'll have a, time, a little time for Q&A after the presentations. I'm going to ask just, since we want to be out of here no later than one, if we can keep the presentations uh, to seven point, uh, uh, the two. We already passed one. We're already 20 minutes late. Uh, so two. Um, so if we can keep the uh, presentations to sort of seven minutes or so. Uh, if not, a little known uh, fact about this room is there's a trap door here. You, away you go after seven minutes. So why don't we go ahead and start with Earl. Thanks, Ken. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk about uh, a program that I've worked personally on for about 10 years. Uh, and uh, this particular program uh, grew out of uh, uh, my uh, history as a, a researcher uh, evaluating medical uh, practices and uh, doing work on evidence-based guidelines um, and recognizing that uh, the gap between what we knew to be the right thing to do and what was going on uh, in terms of the real world was substantial. And uh, as Ken mentioned, uh, closing that gap by improving compliance with what we know to be the right thing to do will uh, um, both improve patient outcomes and reduce cost of care. So uh, I'm going to talk to you about a program uh, that uh, we started developing about 10 years ago. Uh, it's now being delivered to about 12 million people um, who are members of WellPoint. 
And the objectives of the program are pretty straightforward. We are trying to improve compliance with evidence-based guidelines for outpatient care. We're not developing those guidelines. We're taking guidelines that have been issued by uh, the types of specialty societies that Congressman Price referred to. We also look at other types of best clinical practices, such as what's known about drug safety, which often isn't embodied in uh, an evidence-based guideline. We also try to ad increase adherence to use of medications for chronic disease. Uh, unfortunately, there are uh, many instances where appropriate medications are prescribed, but patients don't take them uh, in the way they were intended. And a third objective, um, which results from the first two, is to reduce cost of care. Um, in terms of the key features of the program, it's pretty straightforward. Um, we at WellPoint happen to be in a very good position in that we have a tremendous amount of data about our members. And one of the things that we do is we integrate that data uh, which provides information about every service that an individual receives. Uh, so we take those snapshots and, if you will, convert it into a, a movie, which is a longitudinal record for each member uh, of the health plan. And then we apply to it a series of about 600 computer algorithms that we have developed that are based on these evidence-based clinical practice guidelines. And we do that uh, repetitively, sometimes on a daily basis, in the case of certain uh, drug safety issues, and uh, the majority of instances on a monthly basis. And when we do that, we identify actionable opportunities to improve the care that individual patients are receiving. Once we've identified those opportunities, uh, as I'll show you, we send communications about our findings, both to the individual's physician and to the member themselves. We also provide uh, the member with supplemental uh, consumer health education uh, uh, information from Harvard Medical School through a partnership with Harvard. Uh, and we provide live uh, health coaches that are available for questions uh, through toll-free number. The program uh, as it exists currently uh, addresses uh, almost 600 issues across 80 different uh, diseases and conditions. And I won't go through all the numbers here, but basically it spans the spectrum of um, health maintenance, preventive services, uh, two issues related to chronic uh, medications, uh, and we also identify for people opportunities for them to reduce their out-of-pocket spending on particular meds. The next slide um, just shows you uh, sampling from the 80 chronic uh, conditions. Uh, it's no accident. We, we, we focus on the ones that are most prevalent, but we focus among those on the ones for which there is good evidence about what uh, appropriate practice is. The next slide, um, again, I won't spend much time on, but just to give you a few examples of the types of issues, no rocket science. Uh, you know, these tend to be, if a patient has a particular type of disease, uh, they ought to be on a medication, or they ought to have a particular uh, monitoring test, um, or um, they ought to be getting a particular uh, screening test. Next slide. Again, this isn't meant uh, for you to be able to read, um, but it's a sample of a communication that we send to a physician, and we send information in two forms. One is it's cut first by patient and then by issue. So. For Ken Thorpe, we would send to his doctor a list of all of the issues that we've identified related to Ken. And on the next slide, uh, we send the information cut first by issue and then by patient. So we would send to a physician, here's everybody in your practice who appears to be overdue for a mammogram or a pap smear. Or here's everybody in your practice who's a diabetic 
who appears to be overdue for a hemoglobin A1C. We also send a graphic to the physician that provides information on every medication that the patient's on, and it shows the refill pattern. So the space between those bars is showing gaps in time when a patient ought to have refilled their medication, but they didn't. This is, I, I'm a primary care doc, a general internist. I can tell you that knowing what meds a patient's taking and knowing whether they are taking them as prescribed is extremely helpful. Um, we're in a position to provide that information uh, and think we do it in a way that's pretty user friendly for the doc. This is an example of a new way we're experimenting with presenting information. Instead of sending text messages to a doc, we're sending it in a tabular form that's showing for a patient with diabetes, these are particular types of tests or services they ought to get when the last one was that we see evidence for and whether or not based on that last service, it appears that they're overdue for a particular uh, service. Next slide. This is an example of uh, communication that we send to members. You see on the cover on the left, uh, I sort of think of it as a, a People Magazine headline. Uh, we only address three or four issues in a communication because we think that's probably the limit for what an individual is really going to focus on. And we send them brief messages um, about issues to talk to their doctor about. Um, here you probably can't see it, but we have a logo from Harvard Medical School uh, that indicates after every one of these messages, um, there's a number, uh, and I'll show you in a second, a website where we provide information from Harvard that's directly linked to each message, uh, both to educate the person and quite frankly, to increase the credibility of the messaging. Health plans aren't necessarily you know, known uh, for being uh, the trusted source of information, but by having partnered with Harvard Medical School, we think we increase the credibility of the information. If, the next slide. This is an example of a message. So this is to a patient saying that it appeared from their claims that they have a heart condition named atrial fibrillation. We don't see any evidence that they're on a blood thinner medication. Uh, we explain what the condition is and say that uh, most people ought to be on a blood thinner and recommend that they talk to their doctor about it. So here's an example um, where if a patient goes to the website, enters a particular number associated with a message, and it takes them immediately to information that's personalized related to the issue they have. They don't have to go searching through WebMD uh, or something of that sort. Um, we also put similar information in personal health records uh, for members on the web, uh, and we are uh, experimenting uh, with beginning to uh, send messages in text form. Uh, we're involved with a pilot uh, where messages are being sent to pregnant women, uh, reminding them about things that are uh, appropriate. Um, this just to remind me about the fact that we have care managers to answer questions. Just to give you a sense, um, uh, we started uh, work on this with WellPoint in January 2011. We started with a pilot with about 200,000 patients. Um, we now are providing the service to about 12 million individuals. And last year, um, we sent uh, those personalized health notes to uh, over 8 million uh, over 8 million health notes to a little over 3 million uh, individuals. I'll just mention uh, in closing that uh, uh, we have conducted multiple studies of the program and it works. Um, we did a randomized uh, controlled trial with 70,000 physicians who were randomized to either receive these messages or not receive it. We also did uh, two non-randomized controlled trials, um, and basically we get about an 8 to 10 percent increase uh, in compliance with best practice um, and savings on a commercial population of about 50 cents per member per month and in a senior population of about a dollar per member per month. 
um, we're beginning to send messages to physicians through uh, a multi-payer portal. So this is an experiment where uh, the multi-payer portal is being used by the doctor's office to check eligibility and benefits information. And this enables us to send a message to the doc while the patient is in the office, as opposed to asynchronously the way we do it now based on a monthly uh, batch analysis. Next. Just the last slide, this is uh, another new uh, initiative. I wish Dr. Price had seen this because this is orthopedic. But basically, we've uh, developed interactive uh, web videos uh, for patients uh, with back pain, uh, chronic hip disease, and chronic knee disease to help them uh, understand what their treatment options are um, and what might be best for them. So um, I hope I've succeeded in uh, describing uh, what a health plan's able to do with the information that it has in an effort to try to both uh, reduce the prevalence of chronic disease and reduce the complications uh, associated with it. Thank you. Well, thanks, Earl. That's a terrific example of innovation uh, we see coming out of the private sector on a whole variety of uh, chronic care management programs. Um, you also escaped the uh, trap door. He was 30 seconds away, but you're good. Um, next speaker is Jonathan Lever uh, from the uh, YMCA. Thank you, Ken. Good afternoon. Uh, I was at the launch of uh, PFCD. I just realized it was three years ago and um, really admire all of the work that you guys have been doing since that time. Um, my role is in the innovation department at the YMCA of the USA, which is the national resource office for YMCAs all across the country. And part of my job is to look out onto the horizon uh, over the next five to ten years and try to figure out where the country's deepest needs are and where the YMCA's uh, greatest expertise and opportunities lies uh, to really make a difference. And as I've looked out uh, onto the world uh, with that perspective, one of those overlapping areas is really around chronic disease prevention and the YMCA's role in helping uh, to address it, and more specifically around diabetes prevention. And, and here's, here's why we're focused there. Um, if you think of the diabetes epidemic like this iceberg, uh, you can see that what lurks below the surface is even scarier than what we can see above the surface. 79 million Americans uh, with prediabetes that's uh, over one in three people. So if we just, I had a gym teacher who once said, pair up in threes. Uh, I never understood that. <laughs> but if you just count it off in threes, uh, one in three of us uh, have diabetes and are at risk of developing diabetes uh, in short order thereafter. Um, that's why we at the YMCA are focused on this population below the iceberg, the population that, with prediabetes, in a program that we call the YMCA's Diabetes Prevention Program, YDPP. So let me tell you about the program, but as I do this, I'm going to warn you. Um, you may be saying to yourself, wow, this doesn't sound all that revolutionary uh, as I'm describing it. Um, well, after I tell you about the program, I'll share why we think actually this is the game changer that people have been talking about in Washington for some time when it comes to prevention efforts, when it comes to healthcare delivery, and when we're talking about changing the trajectory of diabetes in the country. So first, a little bit about the program, the WHO. This program is for adults 18 years and older who have prediabetes. So these are the folks below the surface. Um, this is not for children, uh, and this is not for people above the ice, above the water level. That is, people with diabetes. What is the program? The program is 16 sessions long in its core. So 16 weeks in a row with ma monthly maintenance thereafter for up to one year. The program lasts for one hour. And the goal of the program is to lose at least 5% of one's body weight through this program. Now think about that, what 5% is. A 300 pound individual to lose 5% 5, uh, 5 of their body weight is 15 pounds. That's really, now anyone who struggled with weight loss knows it's, it's not easy to do, but we're not talking about losing hundreds of pounds here to really significantly diminish one's risk of developing diabetes. If a person loses 5% of their body weight, uh, the evidence shows that a person can reduce their risk of developing diabetes by nearly 60% if you lose 5% of your body weight. It's a pretty good investment. Uh, in terms of when and where the program is offered, well, it can be offered 
at any time, and it can be offered anywhere. So even in the places where the YMCA is offering the program, the YMCA is actually holding classes at local libraries, federally qualified health clinics. Uh, it's not always at the local YMCA that people uh, are familiar with. Then how does the class work? Well, at every class, people come and they weigh in. Yes, they actually step on the scale uh, in front of other individuals. It's part of the group norming process, but you weigh in at every class. Um, weight is recorded and it's entered into an online tracking tool that only obviously certain people can see, but the point of this is that we're capturing real-time data uh, all of the time. Um, and here's the key. The class is facilitated by a YMCA lifestyle coach. This is a person who is not a highly specialized healthcare professional. This is, for any of you who are part of the YMCA, this is kind of uh, the health and wellness professional at the Y, someone who is very skilled at, mo at motivational interviewing and is really good at facilitating groups. We even have some folks um, who are the maintenance folks who have led this program because they truly are incredible at facilitating groups and inspiring people to change their behavior. So that's uh, a little bit about the class. Like I said, um, not all that revolutionary. So what makes this program a game changer? Well, the first is, as been alluded to earlier, this is truly an evidence-based program. This program has about as much evidence as anyone could ever want. Um, now, for researchers, that's probably not true, but for translating something in the community, I would argue that, it, in fact, it is. This, uh, results of this uh, work have been published in the New England Journal of Medicine and the American Journal of Preventative Medicine in Lancet. Uh, the evidence is deep that if you can get people into a lifestyle intervention, it helps them reduce their likelihood of developing uh, diabetes more effectively than if someone takes a drug, metformin. Uh, the second article in Preventative Medicine proved that if, if the YMCA actually delivers this program, which is what we're doing, which is what I'm describing, they can actually get the same results as if highly specialized clinicians do it on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So the YMCA, with its lay professionals, is as good or effective and, by the way, can reduce the cost by nearly 75% than when it's offered in a clinical setting. So there's as much uh, research here as I think we could ask. Um, it works in community-based settings, uh, and it's been shown to actually have a lasting effect over 10 years. One of the things that people always ask is, well, it's great if people can lose weight in 16 weeks, or they can do it over a year, but can it actually last forever? And the Lancet article, um, the most recent publication, shows that even for people who gain the weight back, participating in a 16-week lifestyle intervention actually keeps the, the likelihood of developing diabetes lower than if they were on medication. So it proves that it can work over the long haul. So it's got a lot of evidence behind it. Well, another reason why we think it's a game changer is because it is cost effective and it can generate a return on investment in a scorable window. And so when we say it's cost effective, when this program is delivered in the Y, it costs about $300 to $350 per person per year to deliver the program. Now, if you're a payer, compare that to any prescription that has to be purchased on a monthly basis and you get the same effect, as re and you actually get a better effect uh, in reducing a person's chances of developing diabetes. It also has an incredible return on investment, sorry, I got ahead of you, uh, ret return on investment. I'll leave that to the other experts like Ken, uh, but the Urban Institute, Ken and others have models that show that this, fact can, that this program can in fact return investment within a scorable window. So it now becomes um, attractive uh, to OMB and others. All right, a lot of people talk about it would be great if we could get employers and insurers to pay for a program like this. Wouldn't it be awesome? Lots of people say that. Well, we have already done that. Um, in fact, we are doing that now. We have some of the nation's largest employers who have signed up, and we have some of the nation's largest insurers who are now offering this as a covered benefit. So this notion of wouldn't it be great if we could just get payers has already happened, uh, and we are, in fact, doing that. This program is also a game changer um, because we are holding ourselves to performance-based reimbursement. Um, and what we mean by that is we at the Y believe that we should only get paid and reimbursed if we get great outcomes. And so the way we have structured our program is that if the person actually loses the weight, the YMCA gets paid. If the person doesn't lose the weight, the YMCA gets a, a much smaller payment. So everyone's interests are aligned, both the individual who is there because they want to uh, reverse their, 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 their trajectory. Um, it's there for the organization to make sure they get a quality experience. 
and it's, it's incented in the right way so the employers or the insurers only have to pay if they get results uh, for their people. So that's another reason why we think it's a game changer. Another reason why we think it's a game changer is scalability. Everybody loves to talk about scalability. Wouldn't it be great if we could just scale this up? Or we have a model of how we would scale this up. And everybody talks about, wouldn't it be amazing? Well, the truth is, we are actually scaling it up. We're not talking about scaling it up. We actually are scaling it up. So on the next slide, you can see this, this unfolds one by one. So from 2005 to 2009, we were in one YMCA in, that had a few sites where this program was operating. At that time, we were talking about how we would scale this but we weren't doing a very good job. So then we go to 2009 to 2010. We scaled, sort of. We got one more Y to offer the program. So we were now in two YMCAs in a handful of sites in those communities. But then in the last six months, 21 new YMCAs in 116 sites in nine new states. We have trained 200 lifestyle coaches who can in fact deliver this program across the country. And so in the last six months, we have shown that we can, in fact, scale this program up nationally across the YMCA movement. And we are still very early in this. You can see this is the last six months, but the trajectory is extremely exciting. By the end of 2011, so if I were standing here next year this time, I would be bragging that we were in 50 total YMCAs in way more than 116 sites uh, in a total of 24 states. So scaling is happening, and it's happening now, with lots, lots more scheduled uh, for 2012. On the next slide, you can see um, the states in which the program is currently or will be off operating through 2011. Uh, those are the 24 states that I mentioned previously. And if you go to the next slide, this is the potential. This is the map of the YMCA, um, the nation's 2,687 Ys. 57% of the U.S. population lives within three miles of a YMCA. So not only do we have the potential to scale the program inside the Y, we also have the potential to reach the vast majority of people in America um, through this program. Um, scaling up this program is going to take a federal investment. Uh, I don't think it's an exclusively federal investment. We've already shown that private payers and employers are, are getting into the mix. Uh, but there is a federal role here in providing funding to get sites up and running to fund the CDC, to do some quality assurance kinds of work. Um, the good news is, as part of health care reform, Senators Luger and Senator Franken worked across the aisle to authorize the National Diabetes Prevention Program. Unfortunately, no funds have actually been appropriated for it yet, um, but the Diabetes Advocacy Alliance, of which the Y is a member, as well as the ADA, uh, Novo Nordisk, as well as others, uh, has requested $80 million annually to fund the National Diabetes Prevention Program. We believe that because of the evidence behind it, its cost effectiveness, its ROI, its scalability, and the fact that it does integrate public and private uh, payers into this, that this is, this is the poster child of the kind of program that was envisioned to be part of health care reform. Thank you very much. Uh, I do have to say that yeah, I've been asked today to give the employer perspective uh, in uh, now, I guess, seven and a half minutes or less. but. Uh, it was in this very building that I got my start uh, on Capitol Hill, and uh, I was talking with someone beforehand who said that uh, this week folks were up to this person. She was up to, uh, until 3 in the morning one night and 4 in the morning on another night uh, going through the 600-some-odd amendments. So in the time that uh, I was up here, I never had to experience that kind of uh, that legislative fun. Uh, but if there are any staff who are looking for ideas for future amendments to cut or to strike, and this doesn't have anything to do with chronic disease. Uh, I, I have a 10-year-old daughter, and um, I have to drive her around in the car, and she's old enough to actually pick her own music these days. So if you could con have your boss consider an amendment to cut or to strike Justin Bieber, I would, <laughs> I would really like that. Um, but let's move, let's move from, uh, from Bieber to business real quick. What we want to give you a sense is, uh, is what an employers are doing to try to promote uh, wellness. Uh, so let's, real quick, let's look at Nova Nordisk. Uh, for those of you who don't know us, we are a diabetes care company and we are the U.S. leaders in insulin. So we have about 4,000 employees here in the United States. Uh, we have people in every state and district and unlike uh, other com companies, we actually do research and manufacturing here in the United States. Uh, we operate under what's called a triple bottom line. 
So everything we do has to pass an environmental, a social responsibility, and a financial test. So obviously we're members of bio and pharma and we're publicly traded, but it's that triple bottom line that informs everything we do, including our workplace wellness programs. So diabetes is really what we do. 80% of what we do is diabetes. So let's talk a little bit about Novo Health. So this is our workplace wellness and our approach to uh, employee and health benefits. What we've done is we've picked four areas to focus on. So we want to focus on uh, healthy food, physical activity, uh, uh, smoking cessation, and individual health advice. So let's start and let, let's look at each one individually, starting with individual health advice. One of the things that we have our employees do uh, every year, and we've done for the last three years, is to go online and create a, or to fill out a health uh, risk assessment. So this is completely voluntary. We don't force people to do it, uh, but you go in and you have to certify uh, that you are exercising. We don't ask how much, we don't ask how frequent, you're allowed to keep track of that on your own. But you have to go in and say that, talk about your exercise and also certify that you've gone and done your preventive uh, screenings for that year. So if you do that, you get a $250 uh, reward, uh, which you are then encouraged to use on something that will benefit your health and fitness going forward. So three years ago I did this and I did use the money to purchase a treadmill which I am proud to say I used on Wednesday as an actual treadmill and not a, a place to hang my clothes. <laughs> um, but we don't, you know, we, don't, we don't check what people do with the 250. But an important note about these risk assessments. As I said, this is the third year we've done it. The first two years we did it, we had the $250 incentive uh, and participation was at about 80% uh, percent the first year, 70% the next year. We tried it this year without an incentive and participation dropped down to 30 percent. So obviously incentives are extremely important to the, the population. Other things that we do in individual health advice, uh, we have kiosks which are at our home office. We have two home offices uh, and there you can sit down and, in, and it, it will store your own information. You go, you log in, but you can get your blood pressure, your BMI, your weight, uh, a number of factors and then over time you can come back and uh, eventually try to see how you are progressing or not progressing against your goals. Those are not yet hooked up to our health benefits plan, but we are hopeful that that's going to happen in the next few years. We also have a number of other ways through communications and incentives that we encourage people to do what they uh, need to do to maintain their health, to get the best advice. Uh, you see some of them listed here, uh, and these are probably not new to you. We waive copays. Uh, for prevention. We send out clinical reminders to folks in the mail. Uh, I just got one for, uh, uh, for my kids' shots. Uh, we do flu shots annually. We have a wellness day. Uh, there's a, a quarterly newsletter solely devoted to health that goes out, an annual calendar. So we do a lot about communication. It's a lot about cultural, and I'll talk about that a little more in a second. I did want to mention in terms of a subset of individual health advice, we're a diabetes care company. Uh, and so we do a lot for our employees, obviously, who have diabetes. The thing I want you to see on this is the, that, if we go to the next one, is uh, the center one, which is, a, there's a website, Cornerstones for Care, uh, which is available to anybody who, who has diabetes to go in, and it's an online tool where people can go on and learn about, uh, put in their own personalized plan to care for their disease. There's all kinds of meal, uh, food exchange lists, all kinds of things. So trying to find mo more ways to get people, to make it easier to manage their disease so we can pre prevent the blindness, that amputation, the heart disease, all those things that end at the end of the diabetes trajectory. Next slide, please. So going from health advice, uh, we do what we can on physical activity. What, what can we do? Make it as easy as we can for people to be involved. We have a gym on site at the home office. Uh, we have a number of employees throughout the country uh, as I said, so we offer discounts for them to join uh, gyms that are near them. Uh, and then we also, if you can't get to the gym that's on site, you want to go to the one near your house, we'll give you a discount to do that. So we do whatever we can to give people as few excuses as they can to not exercise. Trying to promote healthy food uh, at our cafeteria, or our cafe, I should say, uh, in the home office, there's a healthy menu. Those 
items are always priced lower than everything else uh, in order to uh, provide a, a, an incentive for people to order them. Uh, we have vending machines and we have free apples everywhere. On our vending machines, the apple and diet sodas are free, but if you want a Coke or uh, anything that has sugar in it, you have to pay a dollar. Um, we try to encourage healthy options for business meetings. Um, and then we also give a discount uh, on Nutrisystem. So if people want to go ahead and make that stuff. And then the last part of our four different areas of concentration is smoke cessation. And this is similar to most folks. Uh, a lot of other companies offer this same type of thing, which is you have a smoke-free workplace. You try to uh, provide discounts on classes for people to quit smoking. Uh, and then the last thing, you make sure that, if that, that their prescription drug plan covers uh, smoking cessation products. So before I tell you what the bottom line is for all those uh, for us, let me just give you two other quick examples for, that you can look at uh, in your spare time as it particularly relates to diabetes and chronic disease management. One is Pitney Bowes. Uh, which is the document management company where they created what was called value-based insurance design. So some of you have, made, have heard this in health reform, and that's essentially where you try to make things that are, have longer-term value cheaper, things that have lesser value more expensive. And they did it in diabetes and asthma and a couple other items, uh, a couple other places. So by giving lower copays for chronic disease medications, what happened was there was better adherence. People did a better job managing their disease, so there are ER, fewer ER visits, they missed work less frequently, and the overall cost for diabetes went down 6%. Uh, that's a real world solution. In asthma, the, the total cost went down 38%. You all may have heard of the Asheville project in, uh, in North Carolina. That's another one which I'd encourage you to look at. In Asheville, <coughs> the city of Asheville as the employer joined with the hospital and they started getting more folks involved to make it easier for people who had diabetes to do their self-management. So that's working with community pharmacists, certified diabetes educators, and then again, they reduced and made it e either reduced it or made it free to get the medications that they needed. And you see the results that Asheville had were really pretty stunning. Over a five-year period, every year their per patient per year cost went down. Uh, yeah, for each person, from $3,500 the first year all the way to the last year per patient, they were saving $6,500. Pharmacy costs went up, but the overall costs went down. People were doing a better job managing uh, their disease. And importantly, the measure we use to see if people are being healthy for people with diabetes, an A1C measurement, their mean A1C went down every single year. People who had diabetes were healthier and healthier and healthier. So that was all good. Okay, so let's go. What are the takeaways from what we do at Novo Nordis with Novo Health? First is that these things do work and save money. From a bottom line perspective, from our economic bottom line, out of our triple bottom line, the average that D. Eddington uses, and we validate it through our own internal stats, is you save about $56 per year per wellness point. So all our data gives uh, all our insurance data through United Health Group gives us a score on our entire workforce. So for our, we have 4,000 employees, roughly one point equals about $225,000. For us, our Novo Nordisk workforce today is about five to six times healthier than your average United Healthcare Group uh, employee group. So the savings to us as a company on an annual basis is about $1.2 million. So it does make a big difference. But it's not the only reason to do these. You want to do it for other reasons uh, as well. So the other thing I want to point out is that, uh, that there are people, uh, or that people in our culture, uh, in our company culture, it gives it satisfaction. So it's another part, aside from saving money, it's also something that, that people enjoy. As these rules are written here uh, to employ, for example, Value-based insurance design is currently at HHS right now uh, as part of healthcare reform. Flexibility for employers is key. What it works in New Jersey is not going to be the same as employees in Florida or Colorado, wherever it is. So please uh, encourage your bosses to encourage uh, HHS and others to not try to do one size fits all in these right. Don't define workplace wellness. Make sure employees, employers have the chance uh, and the flexibility to do what they need to do with their population. 
And the last thing I would say is that these wellness efforts take time. You can't just drop in a program and expect that you're going to save money. You have to have a culture that fits it. It's taken us three years to go up a couple points in our wellness score, and we already had a pretty vibrant culture. Um, so it's not an immediate payoff, but when the payoff comes, it, it, A, it does come, and B, the payoff lasts. So I'll close by saying we're very proud of the Novo Health, and we think it's one of the reasons uh, that we've been named uh, the best place to work in New Jersey for the last six years. Uh, and for the last few years, we've been in the top 100 of Fortune Magazine's best places to work uh, in the United States. So thank you very much, and I'll turn it back over to Kim. I, actually, I guess I'll turn it back over to Candace. <laughs> Kim's changed a little bit in the break. <laughs> we have time for a few questions, if folks would um, have some. I had one just talking about, um, Jonathan, you touched on it a little bit about scalability. Obviously, we're talking about a variety of different populations here, but finding what works in the different populations. Um, do you see lessons that could be applied in, say, a Medicare or Medicaid or even federal employees program? from what you have learned? So I would say um, the big lesson for scalability for me is it is, it is possible, but it is challenging. And um, I mean, what gives me hope, for us at least, with our network is knowing that we are in all of these places. If you come to a YMCA, what's always so reassuring is you can see a preschool preschooler and you can see an older adult doing an arthritis program in the swimming pool. Um, and so the Medicare population is there, um, access to the Medicaid population in, in local communities. But um, I would say we need to find other organizations, you know, not just the Y, but that have that national infrastructure. Uh, we, for instance, have our own internal training system. So we have regional training centers all over the country. So what are those other organizations around the country that share some of those infrastructure opportunities that can leverage uh, something the great that's happening in Newark to get it out to San Francisco without having to refashion everything from scratch. Um, I think that's going to be the challenge, is really finding those right organizations, those right other agencies uh, that, can, that can reach all of those populations that you described. And Dr. Steinberg, in your program, it sounds like you rely a lot on real time or try to integrate data and create that longitudinal record. I know um, with Medicare, a lot of people complain, even in the demonstration projects, that there's a great lag in time, do you see see opportunities there to change that? Well, there is an, an inevitable lag uh, with medical claims, not with prescription drug claims, uh, which is why on the prescription drug claims, we're able to analyze that every night. Um, but we have uh, done a number of things to try to reduce the latency between uh, when we receive a claim. We actually, um, are interested and able to analyze pre-adjudicated claims um, because we're focused mainly on which services um, have been delivered. But the more timely the data, the higher the accuracy of the conclusions that you can draw. Terrific. And Chris, how about you? I know a lot of small employers sometimes don't necessarily have the resources, but it sounds like you guys focused in quickly on some key areas. Are there some lessons perhaps for for employers of all size, but particularly small employers? Yeah, um, and I don't know, uh, you know, as a company, we had no, no opinion on the health care bill. Uh, we had certain things that, that we were very interested, but uh, I know that there's $40 million a year for employees of 100 or less, for, $40 million a year for the next five years for people to, uh, to try to apply for, and I don't know if any, I, I know that's, you've learned the extent of that, I know about it, uh, but I, I think that that's, uh, you know, as many places that are willing to make the time and investment into it, uh, you have to have the leadership from the top of the company that's willing to do that. You can't be thinking about just next year. You have to be thinking about long term. But the, the value of doing that is that it's not just the bottom line, is that employees like it. You find that there's increased productivity and there's a lot of other activities that go along with it. I, I did want to say one, one thing. You mentioned, you know, we're here in the, in the budget committee room. I see Governor Kasich and Marty Sabo staring at me on the, on the portraits. Uh, you know, in the Medicare population, and Dr. Price mentioned it, you know, there's only 11% of the Medicare population is actually being screened for diabetes. And 
uh, I think the numbers that I heard from, from Jonathan uh, at a different thing was that 72% have either diabetes or prediabetes. I mean, talk about needing to target in the right places. I think just like small businesses trying to find a way to reduce their long-term costs, you need to target in the places where you can do the most. And, and for us, I think diabetes is one of the places. Yes. Uh, you were talking, Dr. Steinberg, about uh, programs where the patients come to you. Are we looking at any programs where you go to the patients? When, uh, um, when you say go to the patient, you mean? Where, where, where a physician or a nurse practitioner where, would make uh, uh, an appointment with, to see the patient at their residence or something like that. To yes. Yes, so um, uh, in the Medicare population, we actually have started a home visit program uh, that focuses on uh, a number of the same types of issues. That program uh, is designed in a way where, you know, it's targeted, uh, you know, to hit members where there are multiple uh, issues to be addressed and we target areas where we have clusters of individuals where it's a little bit more cost effective in terms of doing the home visits. But we are doing that in the Medicare population. We have time for one more question. Did you have one? Okay. Whoever wants to go. With that many um, covered lives, you must have an awful lot of of benefit plans. So is that integrated into the recommendations that you're able to make and does that also apply then to the Medicare population and the sort of coverage that, that one gets automatically by going into Medicare? Yeah, it's an insightful question. Um, that's actually the most complicated aspect of the program. So we do load up everybody's benefits and in messaging to an individual, we actually tell them how much money they would save out of pocket, say if they used a generic drug rather than a brand or if they used a preferred brand rather than a non-preferred brand. Um, we don't, uh, and we ask, uh, recommend that they bring the information to their physician. We don't recommend what they do. We just provide the information. But yes, uh, and if we, we don't recommend services that aren't covered by that particular person's benefit plan but that it's a lot of work loading the benefits. As you can see, there are a lot of great models working in the private sector, and we look forward to our partnership with well, um, WellPoint to highlight some more of these programs in the next series of events. Um, all the materials as well as the video will be posted on our websites, and we'll send out email reminders and let you know how to link to those materials. So thank you all very much, and please join me in thanking our speakers. Thank you.